before you watch the video, please make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to watch more of my videos and that you don't want to miss out on. And if you want to follow my social media, check out my literature, art, and comics. All links will be down in the description below. My Dog Warned Me About My Uncle Written by Particular Dream 215 Lo Who do you love most? Frankie, I said smiling. Frankie, our dog, ran around my legs as if to approve of my answer. My parents and grandparents laughed. Where's uncle? I asked. I want him to come with us trick-or-treating. He's busy, Loby. My real name is Lola. My dad said, but I want uncle to come. My mom crouched down and told me he's busy and that we'd still have a good time without him. Just as I was about to accept this, my uncle started coming downstairs and asked if we were about to head out for trick-or-treating. Do you want to come? My grandma asked. Yeah, sure, he said. My grandma had actually asked him earlier that evening while we were carving pumpkins at the kitchen table. He'd said no, and when grandma asked him why not, he said coldly, because I don't want to and w went upstairs to his room. I hadn't thought much of this and was glad he changed his mind and mood and decided to come. We set out through our neighborhood with my parents, uncle and Frankie. My grandparents stayed home to take care of my baby sister. We visited the first few blocks of Houses decorated with the typical giant web of spiders or white cloth ghosts hovering from trees, rocks like wind chimes. Eventually, we ventured into the long street of a neighborhood near the local park, and that's where Frankie first started to act strange. I want to pause here and say that all of these memories are somewhat confusing for me. It's not like things are a blur, it's more like some things are blurry, while others are perfectly clear, and I can't tell what I might be embellishing. It's hard to separate fact from fiction. I think all our memories are distorted in some way as we reconstruct them as we change. The stories we tell ourselves about ourselves having to continually adjust to mimic who we've become and are becoming. This is my first and only attempt to share these memories. Whether or not anyone believes me, well, doesn't matter, in a sense. We, while I'm sharing my experience, a part of me doesn't want to be believed. Strange as that sounds, I want both my truth to be heard while still having deniability. We trick-or-treated our way around the neighborhood and came to a house tucked into the corner of a cul-de-sac that decided to participate in Halloween half-assed by turning on their porch light and handing out candy, but skipped any efforts of decoration. The only spooky thing about it was that the window on the second floor was lit like a watching eye. We walked up the long front porch steps. Another family was already there waiting for the door to be answered. The 
door opened and an elderly couple smiled and passed out snicker bars. The woman said, why aren't you the cutest little mummy ever? My parents chuckled and my mom said, she's actually a toilet paper roll. Oh, I'm sorry, said the woman. No, no, said my mom. We're flattered you think she's a mummy. Looking back, I've tried to piece together the appearance of this couple, in case it matters in some way. What I can make out is that they were similar in appearance, gesture, facial expression. Their skin was the exact same hue, powdery white, and they both had this perpetual large smile that somehow still hid their teeth. They looked like brother or sister or twins, but they appeared married from the way they interacted together, like a couple of retired folks living out the rest of their stress-free lives. Frankie suddenly started barking and growling. This was different than how we normally barked. When the postman dropped off a package outside our house, he was basically snarling, barring his teeth. It was like he was another dog completely. I remember not recognizing him for a moment. Frankie, stop being stupid, my uncle said. This was actually a running joke in my family. My parents and uncle often said that Frankie was special, i.e. stupid because he would eat his own poop and didn't know how to get out of areas where we penned him off even if there were gaps that he could fit through. My uncle bent down and pet him, and Frankie immediately stopped barking, and it seemed like he was back to his normal self again. I actually don't remember saying goodbye to the couple, walking away from the house, or any other of the trick-or-treating that night. It's funny because I do remember what the house looked like distinctly. The marble angel statue in the corner of the porch and the shraggy bent tree in the lawn whose shape resembled an old man who'd never cut his hair. Frankie was actually ours, owned by my parents but was staying at my grandparents' house for a while since my parents were too busy juggling work and parenthood to really be able to take care of him. He was more on the dirtier, undomesticated side, a small, medium mix between Shih Tzu and Karn Terrier. Thank Chewbacca with tangles of brown fur hanging over his eyes. I actually sometimes call him furry. Calling things by different names was a fun habit of mine. For example, I actually called my uncle Unky sometimes too. And I had a panda bear stuffed animal I called for whatever reason coyote. When we got back home, I sat on the sofa between Uncle and Frankie and watched TV. I actually wasn't allowed to watch much TV, but they put on some cartoon about a bird and dog having a picnic. Frankie nuzzled against my shoulder. Everything was basically normal, but his strange behavior earlier gave me an eerie creeping feeling, almost like I was being watched or something. 
still, I felt happy. Uncle and Frankie were my favorites, probably because we only did fun things like walk to the park and listen to music, whereas my parents slash grandparents forced me to bed and bathe. It was actually strange how much I liked Uncle and maybe even a bit unnatural. He was about 33, 34 at the time. The thing about him is that he always looked the same age, even as I grew into my teenage years and he entered his 40s, he had a baby face and always looked to be in his mid-twenties. And though a few more lines formed in the face as he aged, there was always a youthfulness to him and general clarity to his appearance. In a sense, he was like a life-size version of a doll or mannequin. Each feature alone on him wasn't remarkable. Dark brown eyes framed by glasses, an average thinnish build, and curly long hair that was messy and even chaotic, but somehow all of it together made what I thought was really the most beautiful person. My mom would actually say that she thought I looked exactly like him and I was glad to hear this, especially later in life when I started becoming insecure about my appearance. He was somewhat standoffish, prone to sit at the far end of the sofa in the living room or randomly disappear during dinner. Well, maybe not standoffish, but mysterious. Anyways, it seemed he'd taken a liking to me too. We watched TV until bedtime. Life still made sense, that is, until the next day. At some point in the afternoon, my parents and grandparents were busy making dinner and taking care of my baby sister, so they told my uncle to watch me. He asked me if I wanted to play hide and seek with Frankie, and I said yes as it was one of my favorite games. Who doesn't like hide and seek? The way we played was that my uncle brought Frankie somewhere and hid him. Usually it was a closet or under a desk or he'd make a makeshift fence out of a chair or something to keep Frankie in there. Since Frankie was special, he would sit there trapped, quiet, and helpless. I closed my eyes, counted out loud as my uncle hid Frankie, and then my uncle came back and accompanied me as I went around the house looking for him. After searching, under the tables and some corners of the rooms downstairs, we headed upstairs. I peeked into some rooms but didn't see Frankie. Eventually, I got to my sleeping room, formerly my mom's, now used as a guest room for me when we visited. I found Frankie under the desk in the corner blocked off by my crib i actually don't remember if i was still sleeping in the crib during this time maybe it was just there for storage i found frankie i said then i heard frankie's voice well obviously it wasn't his voice but it was like 
his voice if a dog could talk like a gruff voice but not mean or anything the best way to explain it would be a deeper more serious version of goofy's voice his tone too was like goofy's as if he were speaking to a child i was a child after all and a bit silly lo good job on finding me but now i need your help his lips didn't move he gawked at me with his tongue out of the side of his mouth he didn't look any different i looked wide-eyed at my uncle but he was checking his phone it was obvious he didn't hear anything frankie needs our help i said pointing at him between the chair legs i didn't understand what was happening but when you're three or something completely bizarre happens you sort of accept it as a new addition to reality and don't immediately freak out my uncle looked up from his phone screen and said casually yeah let's get him out as my uncle moved the chair out of the way frankie said lo you can't tell anyone that you can hear me especially uncle otherwise uncle will hurt me you don't want frankie to be hurt do you not if you understand lo but remember don't say anything something in me sank and i nodded don't say anything tonight lo or uncle is going to hurt me more more i said lo why did you say that remember what i just said don't say anything your mommy and daddy and grandpa and grandma and even uncle are going to want to talk but no matter what you can't say anything okay not unless i tell you it's okay otherwise uncle is going to hurt me so much and i'm going to be sad obviously looking back there was no logic for this and none of this made any sense but to a 3-year-old kid who thought that the tv was always broken except once a week for exactly the length of a 1-hour cartoon episode cartoon this was how my parents limited my tv watching time i believed it i nodded again don't nod unless i say so okay lobi don't do anything unless i say so uncle is bad bad man he hurts me when i'm alone at this point we were already walking downstairs frankie hopping down along my side even though he was talking to me his movement seemed normal i felt scared and was quiet for the rest of the night but it took a while for my parents to notice i wasn't talking why are you so quiet lobi my dad asked are you feeling okay said my mom they started to get concerned when i wouldn't answer and would only stare back at them silently Every time Frankie came around, he would talk to me through his mind again and warn me about Uncle. Uncle is a bad, bad man, he kept saying. You have to save me. I looked at Uncle, who was clearing the locks out of his eyes as he often did. How could he possibly be bad? He'd never done anything bad from what I saw. In my eyes, he was perfect. But why would Frankie say these things unless they were true? I trusted Frankie as much as anyone else, despite him being a dog. My parents took my temperature and started calling their friends who had kids, asking if their children 
ever suddenly became completely silent. Just when they were putting on my coat so they could take me to the hospital, Frankie came around the corner of the stairs and said, Talk now, Loby. Otherwise, they're going to take you away and leave me here with Uncle. And Uncle is going to hurt me. Say that you're okay and that you didn't feel good. I'm okay, I finally said. Everyone turned and looked at me. My mom crouched down and rubbed my shoulder. How come you weren't talking, Lo? With all their eyes examining me. I m momentarily forgot what Frankie told me just moments ago. To say, so I stayed silent. Lo, say something, she said, a tremor pricking beneath her words. I looked at Uncle. I don't know if it was because Frankie put the idea in my head or because this was the first time I wasn't telling my parents the truth and this was some type of self-protection or if it was real. But I could see a secret behind his eyes. Like he really was this bad person like Frankie was saying. They kept asking me why I wasn't talking if something was wrong. I remembered what Frankie told me and said I wasn't feeling good, but that I was now okay. They took my temperature and dad stayed with me that night to make sure I was okay. I could hear the murmurs of my mom's concerns downstairs as my grandparents assured her that nothing was wrong. The next day, I nearly forgot what had happened. I guess when we are young, our attention is grabbed by other things, though a feeling of dread and worry lingered in the back of my mind somewhere. I still didn't fully understand what happened and what I was even feeling, but uncle was uncle again. I was too used to him being the perfect uncle, even if it was only my mind that made him that way. My parents were glad that I was back to my normal self, loudly stating what I was thinking and what I wanted. I want milk, laughing when my little sister pooped her diaper. We hung around the house mostly and then at some point my uncle asked if I wanted to play hide and seek with Frankie. The unease that had been mostly forgotten suppressed all trigger and I was actually was on the verge of crying when Frankie, who was laying down in front of me, staring at the wall, said, Don't cry, Loby. Don't cry tears for me, Loby. It'll only make things worse. Uncle doesn't like it when you cry, and he's going to hurt me if you do. My uncle raised an eyebrow since I hadn't answered. He probably couldn't decipher the look on my face, a mix of fear, confusion, and shock. Lo, say yes. Please, Lo, help me. I want to help Frankie, I blurted. I slapped my hand over my mouth. You want to play hide and seek with Frankie, said Uncle, already clapping to get Frankie's attention. Frankie jumped and fretted about, awaiting instructions or anticipating a treat. You said something you shouldn't have, Lo. Now Uncle is going to hurt me when we play hide and seek, unless you help me. Close your eyes, Loby, and count down. Play hide and seek with Uncle and me. 
I buried my face in my hands and began counting down out loud. I heard Uncle clap and snap a few times, then departing footsteps as he lured Frankie to a hiding location where I was convinced Frankie would get hurt even though Uncle would never hurt anything or anyone, especially Frankie. Obviously, this is a contradiction, but it held true in my mind in that moment. When I'd count 22, I remembered that number for some reason. Uncle came back, tapped me on the shoulder and said, Okay, let's go seek Frankie. I listened for Frankie's voice for some reason, expecting him to tell me where he was. He was in danger. After all, wasn't he? Though Uncle was next to me, it still seemed Frankie was in danger somehow. I ran around the living room checking corners and beneath furniture, behind the sofa, starting to sweat and about to cry. Ah, wow, she's so into the game today, my mom said casually from the kitchen table where she was placing blueberries on my sister's booster seat tray. Where's Frankie? My uncle said playfully. I ran to the stairs and went up as quickly as I could. Lo, remember to grab the rails so you don't fall, my uncle said, coming up behind me. I did as he told and used my arms to pull me up the steps even faster. At the top, my head felt light and spun for a second. I nearly fell sideways, but my uncle caught me. Lo, be careful, he said. Where's Frankie? I nearly yelled. Uncle chuckled with amusement and tousled my hair. I don't know, but let's go find him. I rushed through the hallway and checked each bedroom as quickly as I could until we reached my uncle's room at the very end. His door was closed as he usually kept it and I did my best to open it but fumbled with the knob. He opened it for me and we went in. It smelled like uncle, a husky citrus, even though his bed was made immaculately. Some clothes were bunched on the corner. Sunlight swirled in the glass of water on an otherwise empty desk. I'm in the closet, came Frankie's voice. I pointed to the closet door in the corner. Do you think Frankie's in there? said Uncle. I nodded. Well, Let's find out, he said. The door turned out to not be actually closed all the way, so I was able to push it open. My uncle flipped on the light and I went in and searched with my hands through the rows of neatly hung clothes. It was a small walk-in closet. Is he here? My uncle said. I fumbled a large jacket out of the way and, to my great relief, found Frankie sitting in the corner with a ditzy look that always had. Frankie! I nearly screamed and hugged him. Staring at me, panting, he said, Lo, uncle's going to choke me tonight. Do you know what that means, Loby? It means that... He's going to wrap his fingers around my neck and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze until my neck breaks and I can't breathe anymore. During this time, 
uncle was saying something to me, probably congratulating me on finding Frankie and suggesting we should go downstairs, but I was too fixed on Frankie's words to listen. I slapped my forehead in disbelief at what was going to happen. I was about to turn to uncle and say something, though I don't know what I was going to say. When Frankie reminded me, remember, don't say anything, Loby, to uncle or mommy or daddy or grandma or grandpa or anyone, or you can't save me. How do I save? I asked. Uncle looked at me funny. What was that, Lo? I didn't answer. Uncle began nudging me out of the closet and telling me we should go back downstairs and join my parents when Frankie, who was behind us, said, You shouldn't have done that. I just told you, Loby, to not say anything. Now the only way you can help Frankie is if you throw yourself against the wall as hard as you can. I stood frozen, confused. Please, Lo, do you love Frankie? You always say you love Frankie, and he's going to die if you don't run into the walls now, said Frankie. Jump into the walls and keep running and jumping into the walls. My heart was about to leap out of my chest. This is your last chance to save Frankie, Frankie said. He doesn't want to die. I hurled myself into the wall in the closet, and before the pain could register, I spun and banged into the opposite wall, and then tumbled backwards through a line of hung-up shirts and hit the side of my head against something. It all hurt more than I anticipated, and the next moments were blurred. Though I do remember the sensation of being carried downstairs, I think by my dad, who'd come in, the concern of my family members' faces, and my family asking my uncle what happened. The next thing I really remember was waking up downstairs in the room my sister typically slept in. My dad next to me, I guess they were still concerned as to how I was doing, so he stayed in, watched me the entire time. My body ached as I got up and walked out into the living room. I could feel a tension in the air. But it wasn't just that my family was worried about me. It was the same sensation I felt when my parents argued about something at home and didn't make up. Usually something like not washing the dishes clean enough. My grandparents and mom came and took turns asking me if I was feeling okay rubbing my shoulder and feeling my forehead. Frankie greeted me from behind by brushing against my leg, and I was glad to see he was okay. You saved me from Uncle Lo, came his voice as he stared up at me. Thank you so much. You can talk now, but remember, don't tell anyone why you hurt yourself or he's going to kill me. Where's uncle? I asked, barely managing to get the words out. My mom sucked on her teeth in an annoyed way. He's upstairs. The next 10 minutes or so, they asked me what happened upstairs and how I hurt myself. I did my best to stay quiet and give vague answers like, I hurt myself or I fell. Plain dumb as if not quite understanding what they were asking. So they asked me more specific things like, How'd you fall? Or, How'd you get this bruise on your arm? Looking back, it was like a police interrogation where different cops come in and ask in different ways to try and get information. 
I also felt guilty. Weird as that sounds, since I'd hurt myself and was keeping a secret from them. Either way, Mom said to my dad afterwards, he should have taken better care of her. I knew she was talking about Uncle. Uncle didn't join us for dinner later. Either instead went out. I didn't see him the rest of that night, even though I'd asked where he was and kept saying I wanted to see him. It was both my natural habit to want him to be around, but also I couldn't conceive of him being bad or hurting Frankie, the way Frankie was saying. Still, through the rest of the night, Frankie would remind me to stay quiet about what happened. When the next morning came, our family didn't linger around and left soon after Wyatt came. Uncle was coming downstairs as we were heading out the door. Bye, Uncle, I said. He said goodbye, but averted his eyes quickly and disappeared into the kitchen. We didn't visit my grandparents' house for some time, probably a month or two, though it might have been shorter. And when we finally did, Uncle was gone the entire weekend. Then, around the holidays, I remember Christmas decorations being put up. We went to their house and Uncle was there again. I was overjoyed since I haven't seen him in a while. Even though I'd believed Frankie's words, Uncle was still the perfect uncle in my head. The two ideas somehow coexisting in my three-year-old mind. There was still tension in the air, though, but it seemed somewhat diffused. I noticed my uncle didn't ask me to play hide-and-seek anymore with Frankie, and I was honestly relieved, since I was afraid for Frankie's safety if we did play. At this point, though, I hadn't heard Frankie's voice since the whole incident, and life seemed to be resuming back to normal. The next evening, I was downstairs in the living room with uncle and dad when I asked I wanted my stuffed animal, Foxy. Foxy was actually a wolf plushie. Where is he? My dad asked. I think he's upstairs, uncle said. My dad asked if I wanted to go get him, and I said yes. My uncle and dad came up together with me as I ran up and went into my sleeping room. Foxy was in the corner of a desk, and I crawled under and got him. As we were walking back down the hallway towards the stairs, I heard Frankie's voice from somewhere below. Loby, it's Frankie. I paused, looked around, and spotted him at the bottom of the stairs. You need to save me again, Lo, from Uncle. I turned around and looked up at Uncle, who looked at me curiously. My dad and Uncle both were telling me that we should go back downstairs, but their voices slipped into the background as Frankie said, Throw Foxy onto the floor. Throw him as far as you can behind Uncle and Dad. I hesitated, but Frankie pleaded. Please, Loby, you don't want Frankie to die, do you? Frankie will miss you so much if he dies. His voice was desperate. I launched Foxy as far as I could, and he landed somewhere behind my dad in the hallway. Lo, why'd you throw Foxy? My dad asked as he went to get Foxy for me. Jump downstairs, said Frankie, and save me. Please, Lo, before it's too late. I knew that I'd get hurt if I jumped, but didn't really understand how badly. My parents had drilled me that I was always to hold the rails and go slowly up and down steps. It won't hurt, Lo, said Frankie. 
please jump, please, now, or uncle's going to kill me. I dashed to the edge of the stairs and was about to leap when I felt hands grab and pull me back down. Uncle had saved me. Lo, what are you doing? Dad yelled. He dropped Foxy and ran over and held my arm tightly. We don't run near the stairs. You almost fell. Did you know how hurt you could have been? I looked down at Frankie, smiling up at me through the stairs. His tongue hung out. He didn't say anything. Why'd you do that, Lo? My dad asked. Why'd you do that? Uncle asked, searching my eyes. I started crying then, emotions that I couldn't understand overrunning me. My dad held me in a hug and soothed me, patting my back. The rest of the night, I watched every moment severely. They'd always keep an eye on me, of course, but now they stayed close to me, didn't let me go near the stairs, and made sure I wasn't around any table corners. I felt both safe and unsafe. I kept looking for Frankie. He seemed to be avoiding me. Strange as that sounds, staying in the other rooms and not quite looking in the eye when he did walk by to go to his food or water bowl. This was also a turning point for me in how I saw Uncle. Before, I wasn't able to completely conceive that he could be bad, but now I heard Frankie accuse him enough times and enough things had happened that I was able to see him as possibly dangerous to Frankie. Looking back, I think that before this point, I'd created an alternate bad uncle in my mind during Frankie's accusations as an uncle separate from my real uncle. I didn't know if that makes sense, but there you have it. As I was in bed that night, downstairs again, my parents decided to switch my sister and me because they didn't want me near steps. Woof. My grandma next to me, I overheard in the kitchen my parents and uncle. They talked for a while, and I can only imagine that they were talking about what happened. The next day, we stayed around until late morning. I was still being watched closely. I could tell that Whatever lingering tension there was between my mom and uncle had disappeared. They were easier around each other and the edge in their words towards each other were gone. I could only assume that my dad told her that my uncle basically saved me from jumping down and I gained her trust again. Frankie. I noticed still seemed to be avoiding me. Though I'd catch him glance at me from afar every now and then. When I tried to approach and pet him, he stuck around for a few moments but then wandered off casually. I desperately wanted to hear him say something. Maybe it's okay if Uncle isn't going to actually hurt me, but he didn't. I remember wanting to see him and say bye when we left, but I became distracted with my parents getting us ready to leave. And also, they told me that he, we were going to see the doctor, so that began to dominate my mind. As... We drove away from my grandparents' house, though. Everything felt as if it were once again returned to normal. 
as if Frankie's warnings and the possibility of Uncle being a bad man were just a dream that I was slowly shaking off. I don't remember visiting the doctors, though I'm pretty sure we went, unless my parents changed their minds and decided I was fine. Life resumed at home, and I became occupied with toys, playing, nap time, and dancing to my favorite song. A country song, I think, was called Move. Everything was okay, it seemed. A few weeks later, we went over to my grandparents' place. Around this time, I noticed my parents seemed different, but I couldn't tell why. Just a slight sadness in the way they walked, a slowness in which they moved, like they were tired. I didn't realize why until we got there. I went in through the door and my grandparents greeted me as usual with a hug and kiss. My uncle came downstairs and said hi as well. I looked around and noticed Frankie's house, cage in the corner, along with his blankets and toys were all gone. Where's Frankie? I asked. My family all looked at each other. Where's Frankie? I repeated. Loby, my mom said, crouching down in front of me. Frankie's not here. I asked again, where's Frankie? As if simply stating those words was going to eventually make them appear. I ran past them and around the stairs into the living room. Where's Frankie? I asked. They hurried over to me. Frankie's away, my grandpa said. I want to see Frankie, I said. My stomach began sinking. I knew something was wrong. Frankie had to go away. When is he coming back? My mom sighed. He can't come back, Loby. He's passed on. You're not going to see him anymore. But it's okay, because he loves you. Yeah, Frankie still loves you, said Grandpa. I, I want to say goodbye to Frankie. I said, I want to say goodbye to Frankie. We can't right now, said my dad. Uncle, I said. What is it? Uncle asked. Uncle hurt Frankie. Everyone's eyes stretched wide, including my own. I couldn't quite believe what I'd said either. Uncle didn't hurt Frankie, my dad said. Uncle hurt Frankie, I screamed, pointing at him. My uncle flitched. Why is she saying that you hurt Frankie? My mom asked him, looking at him with accusation. I don't know. Uncle hurt Frankie, I screamed. I want to say goodbye to him. Why is she saying you hurt Frankie? My mom repeated. My uncle shrugged in annoyance. I told you, I don't know. I started crying and could barely register my family's words after that. Eventually, I cried myself until I felt tired and sleepy, and my parents put me to bed. I actually don't remember any specifics as to what happened the rest of the weekend, though I do remember that everything suddenly su felt subdued, quieter. The tension between my uncle and sister was back, too, and it never fully go away. I can still feel it to this day. When we gather with other relatives during holidays and they sit on opposite ends of the table as far as possible from each other. I suppressed these memories until one day when I was 11, sitting in the back of the car as my dad drove my sister and me home from school. I was staring out the window, the line of kids getting on a bus, when a car passed carrying a dog with its head stuck out the window. It seemed to look right at me, and I actually thought it was Frankie for a moment. What? What happened to Frankie? I said into the silence of our car. 
My dad looked at me in the rear view mirror. There was something distant in the look, as if he were trying to recognize me as his daughter. What do you mean, Lola? I want to know what happened to him, how he died. Why are you asking this? Just tell me, Dad. I. I didn't get to say goodbye, I thought. He made a left turn onto an adjoining street. He was hit by a car, remember? He said rather coldly. I sat numb for a moment. It was as if it had just happened moments ago, and I was now hearing the news. I was three again at my grandparents' house, frozen and numb with confusion. Was he with uncle when it happened? I asked. Uh, I think so, yeah, he said. But how did it happen? My voice nearly cracked. It was uncle's fault, wasn't it? My dad glanced at me in the rear view. No, Loby, it was an accident. Why would you say that? We never talked about this, I said. You never told me about this. Lo, we did. We came to a stoplight. My dad's eyes wandered somewhere in the, to the distance. Lola, uncle was walking Frankie and Frankie broke the leash and ran into the street. He got too excited. You remember how he used to do that? I remembered and in that moment felt the physical tug on Frankie's leash as he excitedly pulled forward. But he was a small dog. He broke the leash? How? Lo, I don't know. My dad pinched the skin between his eyes, squinting. Accidents happen. Things happen. Okay, Lo? We don't always have to talk about everything. He looked like he was getting a headache, though I don't think it was from the questions so much as from a general growing frustration with life and our family. Not going to get into this here. I didn't want to press him further, so I said nothing. I wish there was more to tell you, but there really isn't. As I've mentioned, all of this is muddled in my memory. I'm not even completely sure everything I mentioned here happened the way it did. What parts might be embellished or what parts are missing? The whole experience is like a dream I might never have had. I do have this growing sensation through this intuitive feeling that Frankie in some way sacrificed himself for me. That if he didn't get hurt and die, it wouldn't have fallen on me. They don't ask me anymore who I love the most. They haven't for a while, since I grew out of those early years of my childhood. Grandpa, Grandma, Mom, Dad, Uncle, they used to ask me this, and I'd say, Uncle and Frankie. And they'd laugh and say that I loved Uncle most and Frankie second, and everyone else after. I don't know how I'd answer now. Even if Frankie were alive, even if our family was together and not suspicious of each other, like before, when we were all happy in life, rocked along a steady yet exhilarating current. I haven't heard Frankie's voice since that day, when I nearly jumped off the stairs, but I have a feeling he's still around, watching over me, reading even these words as 
I'm writing them here, trying to warn me of a danger I can't understand.